Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the photos. If you could go back to your seats. Thank you so much. Merci pour les photographes. Si vous pouviez retourner à vos places. Please. No, no, um, maybe later. Mesdames et messieurs les photographes, si vous pouviez retourner à vos places, s'il vous plaît. Ladies and gentlemen, please stop the photography and come back, go back to your seat. Thank you so much. We have to start the press conference. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, guys, I'm very happy to be here with the, all the talents from The Dead Don't Die, the first film in competition in Cannes this year. Yeah, yeah come on. Let's follow Mr. Murray's lead. <laughs> All right, so right at the far left at the table, we have the co-producer of the film, Carter Logan. Next to him, a gentleman who doesn't need any introduction, Mr. Bill Murray. Next to Mr. Murray, the singer, the actress, and the producer, Selena Gomez. Oh. Please, some applause for Madame Tilda Swinton. Oh. 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 He won four prizes in Cannes already. Ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur Jim Jarmusch. Next to him, Mademoiselle Chloé Sévigny. Oh, come on, let's hear it for her. <laughs> And the other co-producer of the film, Joshua Astrakhan. <laughs> And I want to acknowledge the presence of other members of the team, the Dead Don't Die team, in the first row, the actress Sarah Driver. She's right here. Stand, please. Stand, please. One of the... Sarah Driver, ladies and gentlemen. Stand, please. The incredible DP, Mr. <laughs> Frederick Elms. Stand, please. And the costume designer, Catherine George. <laughs> Hola. All right, guys, I start with questioning. Monsieur Jarmusch, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Uh, since this is a zombie movie, I'd like to start by quoting the master of the genre, George Romero. I asked him a question once, and I asked him if a zombie movie had to be subversive, or at least a little political, to be good. He answered, no, it can just be entertainment, but it's a hell of a lot better if it means something. <laughs> do you agree on that? Do you share this statement? Yeah, I do, and uh, you know, George Romero is certainly our, our guide as far as kind of postmodern, what are zombies, you know? So um, I, I very much look up, we looked up to George Romero and we put a lot of references uh, in our film to, to his films. How about the subversive aspect of it? Well, you know, I think just the zombie, zombies as metaphor is so laden, and I think some of the things that I, I read this morning, in fact, about our film um, were things that honestly hadn't quite occurred to me. So I think the metaphor is stronger than even I was uh, analyzing or aware of, in a way. But yes, definitely it's part of the zombie mythology, but the, the metaphorical, inherent metaphorical thing of zombies. All right, I'm gonna open the floor, Peter, over there. Good morning, Peter Hall from the Toronto Star. Congratulations on The Dead Don't Die, which I enjoyed a lot. Thank I have you. a question for Jim Jarmusch. Um, I'm qu inquiring into your, maybe your changing horror aesthetic. Um, in Only Lovers Left Alive, you really didn't uh, have much blood, but you go in for the full zombie shit this time, for, um, you know, to quote Tom Waits. Do you perceive a shift in your emphasis in your treatment of horror? Maybe, Tilda, you might have a thought on that as well. Well, I don't really compare things. Uh, I, I, I also don't look back, and I, I don't really know that I'm the best person to respond to things in the films. But uh, yeah, I, I, for me, Only Lovers Left Alive was a love story, um, and Vampires was its kind of metaphor. And in this case, zombies are a very different kind of metaphor. 
Um, I, I wanted to avoid making too much of a kind of splatter blood film, uh, which is also why I, I wanted the zombies to be desiccated and only uh, dried up dust, because otherwise the film would have really been a bloodbath. And I kind of wanted to get most of the bloody stuff out of the way with our first uh, hero zombies, the coffee zombies. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think of this as a horror comedy, but I, the balance of it, I am not the best person to even understand that yet. So uh, sorry for that inarticulate answer. Over there. Uh, hi, I'm David from Movie of China. My question is for Tilda. Uh, I'd like to ask you, have you read the whole script when you're shooting the film, or you like Bill just read part of it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I read the script. But I do remember the first time I, I heard uh, uh, Jim uh, mention this film. I mean, I would say that actually, in answer to the previous questioner, in Only Love is Left Alive, we do have zombies. Zombies do make an appearance, they're mentioned. And, and I remember thinking at the time, ooh, I bet you Jim's gonna not be able to resist making a zombie film next. And he did quite soon after we made that film say to me, we're gonna make a zombie film, what do you think? Way before there was a script. Uh, so yes, I did read the whole script. Although the script is one thing and the film is something else. So there are always surprises. And we all saw, well not Jim, but the rest of us all saw the film for the first time last night. So yeah, we were, we were agog. Over there. Hi, David Sanderson from The Times. It's a question for Tilda, not to do with zombies, but more to do with fashion. I read an interview with Heider Ackerman recently, and obviously a lot of thought goes into how you look in the red carpet. And in comparison, sorry men, but you look quite dreary and it's a monotonous parade. Do you think it's time that the, the dress code for the red carpet was shaken up for men? I'm not aware of any dress code on the red carpet, um, and I think that the men all look spectacular all the time. <laughs> Especially when they're wearing Heide Ackermann. I think we have a question in the second row. Oh, first, first, first. Hi, Jason. Hi, Jason Gover from thatshelf.com. Uh, Jim, if you could talk about your own love of Romero, how it developed, and when you first experienced this film, and all the other actors, if you could talk about your own connection with horror films, about what scares you, but what movie might have sort of uh, really thrilled you maybe as a kid that continues to scare you to this day. Oh boy, well, uh, certainly Night of the Living Dead was the first Romero film I saw, and since seeing that, I saw pretty much most of his films. Um, I, you know, as a child, I first saw mostly the Universal monster movies, which had a big impression on me, especially Dracula, which I, I'm a big, more of a fan of, of uh, vampires than zombies. Um, there are many, many, uh, horror directors that I love, um, some even contemporaries like Sam Raimi. Uh, I like John Carpenter's films. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm more of a, I have a very wide interest in all types of films. So uh, horror is not my biggest, at my biggest uh, expertise is not in horror films, although I've absorbed a lot of them. So. But uh, Romero is extremely important because uh, he really changed the idea of zombies, uh, you know, and monsters too, because, uh, and I'll try to keep this short, but monsters in films like Godzilla or, or Frankenstein, they come from outside the social structure and they are menacing from outside of it. Um, with Romero, the zombies come from within a collapsing social structure and they also are victims as well. So it's very interesting what, what Romero did with zombies, making them both the victims and the kind of monsters. Um, and he did very interesting things with the films by using its own kind of awkwardness as part of, I don't know, the fabric of the film and how it affects us. So he used a lot of uh, limitations, obviously, as strengths in that film. So again, we had a lot of references to, to George Romero. The actors, do you want to follow up on the question and uh, answer what's your own relationship to the horror genre? Sorry? I didn't your own relationship to the horror genre. Oh, um, well, it's pretty nascent, my relationship with the horror <coughs> genre. I've been, uh, been dabbling recently with Luca Guadagnino 
in a certain amount of uh, of, of jump scaring. Um, no, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm very unversed in horror. I wasn't really exposed to horror when I was young, um, and I'm slowly working out that it thrills me to the core, uh, and it's not actually uh, a, a, a scare that I want to avoid. But I also wanted to include um, some, you know, European uh, directors, Mario Bava and Dario, Dario Argento, and um, last night at the dinner, I got to meet for the first time John Carpenter and Dario Argento. So it was pretty cool, I must say. <clears throat> Clay, one word about, about that? Um, well, uh, yeah, when I was small, I saw The Exorcist and it terrified me. And I went to my priest because I was raised Catholic and I, and I explained my fears to him. And he said, yes, it's true. And it usually happens to young girls, so don't play Ouija or practice witchcraft, or you're inviting the devil into your soul. So I've been terrified ever since. <laughs> Selena, any experience like this? <laughs> um, not necessarily that, but I'm obsessed with horror films. So uh, growing up, my dad used to let me watch them just to scare me so he could laugh. Uh, but eventually I became obsessed. So... Um, I don't know. I like everything from Zombieland to 28 Days Later, um, um, The Walking Dead, and this uh, Netflix series called Black Summer. So I'm obsessed with zombies for sure. <laughs> yeah. Monsieur Murray? Uh, I, I find Ken frightening. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see any zombies on the croisette so far. <laughs> Says you. <laughs> uh, Nadia has a question right here. Hi, I'm Nadia Nirafita from South Africa. Uh, Mr. Jomish, I'm still swooning from Patterson, so thank you so much for that a few years ago. Uh, I would like to know, the zombies in this film come because the, pl the planet has been destroyed by you know, humans. What the cast and uh, producers, what do you think is the most pressing issue? What are you most worried about when it comes to our planet? Thanks. Who wants to start with that? Wait, are we together? Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure about, um, I mean, I think that our world is going through a lot, obviously, but I would say for my generation specifically, and I guess this is what kind of, um, what Jim gestured to in the film is that social media has really been terrible for my generation. I understand that it's amazing to use your platform but it does scare me when you see how exposed that these young girls and young boys are and they're not really aware of the news or anything going on. It's a very, uh, it's, it's just, I don't want to say selfish because that feels rude, but it is a, I think it's dangerous for sure. I don't think people are getting the right information sometimes. I would say maybe doubtlessness uh, and the difficulty that people have uh, in changing their minds about things, uh, maybe that. Any other, anyone want to? Nobody wants to say anything else. Well, I will say, uh, you know, that watching nature decline at uh, unprecedented rates in the history of humans is, for me, terrifying and uh, concerning. And what really concerns me is a kind of, uh, not apathy, but, uh, I don't know, a failure to address something that threatens, uh, it threatens all living species and in a very rapid decline. So this, uh, that disturbs me and scares me a lot, more than anything. I think we have a question over there. Hello, uh, Ernesto Garrat, Chilean Press. Uh, I'm here. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Bill Murray, who is working with Mr. N Mr. Jim Jarmuch in order the, to get the sense of humor and, and get the, 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 the tone uh, in the movie, in these zombie movies? How was the experience to work with Mr. Jarmuch? Well, he's a barrel of laughs. <laughs> he is. <clears throat> uh, I don't, he doesn't need my help uh, with the sense of humor, particularly. Uh, we just work on posture and manners. <laughs> and uh, uh, 
It's, it's a delight to be on the job. Uh, making movies is, uh, is a dangerous uh, business. It's far more dangerous than people think. Uh, and we, every day you go to work, there's the chance that someone could be seriously injured or hurt. And it sounds crazy, because we look so fabulous up here, especially the men who I'm going to stick up for fashion-wise. Uh, uh, when you think of the danger and the jeopardy that we went through just uh, getting into this building today. Uh, <laughs> so I think the, tr trying to keep light and realize that this could be the last day of shooting every single day is a way to come to work. You know, that this is your wrap day, this is my final day of work, and you try to treat it that way, and you try to treat everyone on the set that way. It's, uh, it's, uh, it kind of makes it easier. You, you want to be one less burden for the director. And he's, he's, I mean, look at what, it, look what he has to deal with up here. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. Why aren't you protecting our director more, Carter? So I hope I've confused you. <laughs> uh, I got a question for, for, for Joshua and, and, and Carter. Is it easy to set up a a zombie movie by Jim Jarmusch in Hollywood? Is it easy to set up this movie? Wait, wait, in Hollywood? <laughs> I mean, yeah, in America, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. no. Why, why not? Um, uh, I think making every movie is, is challenging. Uh, this one in particular, uh, you know, there's a lot coming at you and there was a lot coming at us. Their zombies were real, uh, they involved <laughs> hours of makeup and stunt training and uh, quite a lot of planning and execution on top of making a normal film. I think that was new for both Josh and I, as long with Jim, on the level that we executed in this film. And uh, I think that uh, the results speak for themselves. We had an incredible team of VFX experts, uh, stunt people, <laughs> the most enthusiastic group of extras I've ever encountered. So um, everyone really came together to do this um, and can't thank them enough. Just, yeah. just, just in terms of setting up the film, um, we were particularly uh, happy, fortunate, lucky to find Focus Features who um, were our partner in making this movie and um, there would be no film without them. Got a question right here? Uh, hello, I'm Pier Paolo Festa from Italy, Film.it. Question for Bill Murray. Um, apparently, when a director wants to give you offer a role, he has to call out like an answering machine. So I guess he has like 60 seconds to pitch you a role. And what what does a director have to say? Does he have to charm you? How did Jarmusch make it? Jim just throws a lot of money at you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, he's he's complete BS. He just throws a lot of money at you, and gifts, lots of presents. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, I, for days and days, things start arriving at your door, and it's like, oh, God, Jarmish wants me to work for him. You, know? you can tell who it is by the way he operates. He's an operator. Mm. The guy's a shyster. <laughs> he's a manipulator. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's with us here today. Um, I don't know how the hell I got this job. I really <coughs> don't. I don't. I just was excited to... Uh, the script was funny. I don't know how I got the, the script. It, he, he, uh, he, well, he, you know, he's sort of, he, she, he lives in black and white in a kind of funny way, you know, so the, the it's about shadows with him, you know, it's day for night, a lot of day for night with him. Uh, he comes at you in the daytime, but dressed as darkness. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a question over there. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm uh, Inge Maria Olsson from Norwegian newspaper Dagbladet. Congratulations on uh, a fascinating uh, film. Uh, and I have a question for Mr. Jarmusch. I was thinking that there are, it's fascinating how several of the stories in the, this film are kind of fatalist. It's about knowing the script to your own movies, you know how it will end, and it's sort of also about facing a threat that actually can't be conquered. So as I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. What were your thoughts on the strengths of fatalism in this film? And also, why did you think the quotes from Mo Moby Dick fitted into this narrative? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, starting with the end, I'm not really sure why Moby Dick fits into the film. Um, but I, I wanted to, uh, 
I just wanted the character of Hermit Bob to be someone who would appreciate this and find this book. Um, Hermit Bob having divorced himself from any kind of social order and living in the woods, but still receiving in, you know, inspiration somehow from some human expression, and uh, Melville being a, a great one. Uh, the question before that was... Fatalism. Fatalism. Oh, yeah. How could I forget? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, again, I'm not so conscious about how dark the film even is, frankly. Um, obviously, it is to a large degree, but I was trying to balance certain things, uh, obviously humor and uh, this kind of darkness, and also uh, through the character uh, that played by uh, Riza from Wu -T the Abbot, the leader of the Wu-Tang Clan and a longtime friend, he does have a very positive thing, he says, which is uh, a very simplistic thing about the world is perfect, appreciate the details. So in the midst of watching our planet um, being in really grave danger um, now, also we have to, for me, and I, I don't, we have to, I don't, I'm not trying to tell anyone what to do or think, but for myself, uh, appreciation of human consciousness is something so incredibly beautiful and we don't even know in the universe how rare it is to have consciousness and to appreciate the tiny moments of our lives every day. So I wanted that somehow in the film too and not just, uh, ju not just the fatalism of it, but uh, the darkness is a big part. Um, humor, I hope, is a big part, too, because without jokes or comedians or comic things, uh, it would be very difficult to stay alive as humans, in my opinion. We have a question over there. Uh, hey, I'm uh, from an Iranian uh, television. Uh, congratulations. Um, you have had many Iranian aspects in your previous film, but... Uh, last uh, like la uh, last year can no film from Iran this year so um, uh, my question is um, is it clear you um, you more mad about this uh, um, problem in the world this year uh, these years or more uh, about cinema I mean it's it's a it's a um, um, con uh, you are you are, it, it, it's, it seems you, you more, uh, you more uh, have a problem with cinema or uh, with, with the problem of the in, in uh, our world these years. That's a question for whom? Bill? <laughs> I'm going to pass that one over to Bill. <laughs> well, it, I'm sorry there's not an Iranian film here this year because I'd ask that question of the Iranian director if I could. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to work a little harder than I've been working on some of the other questions because I think yours is a good one and the others were not. <laughs> uh, I think uh, this is what we do for a living up here. This is, this is what we do and Speaking only for myself, I'd say I'm at my best when I'm working for, for a living. But when I'm not working, I'm lazy. Hmm. And, I, and I feel the vitality of film is a, is a sort of representation of the best of my current state of consciousness, if you will. So I, I'm a better person when I'm working on a film. So the two are close for me. The state of, of the, my work in a film is pretty much my, is my, the high point of the week or the month or the year of my state in life. And my concern for the planet is, is, is mirrored, is, is, is explained and demonstrated in my concern for a film and the people that I work with on a film. So that's, this is how I operate. This is my opportunity, my chance. Uh, the one that I demand of myself, that I bring my, the most of myself to. And, uh, you know, even, even this is sort of my work in film. I'm trying hard to be with you here. You know, so this is, 
Um, uh, this is my little uh, ice flow that I stand on, and I hope it doesn't melt. Hello, good morning. This is Laura Sanchez from W Radio Colombia. My question is for Bill, Bill Murray. Uh, good, good, good evening, Bill Murray. It's a pleasure. To, good evening. To, I hope my question is not too difficult. Um, do you uh, believe in life after death? I'm wondering because you were chasing ghosts first and now you're chasing zombies. Does this idea cross your mind? Thank you. I'm going to chase you. <laughs> you can do I'm, I'm, it. I'm going to chase you. Uh, I, I don't, I, I believe in life after death, but not for everyone. <laughs> so, heads up, some of you I'll see and some of you I might not. <laughs> Truly, I mean that. So, I hope, hi, so, hi, I'm later, here. later, see you later. <laughs> I think we have a question about that. Hi, I'm uh, Ole Costa from TV2 in Denmark. Everyone, feel free to answer my question. If you look at the competition this year, you will find four movies directed by women. What do you think about that figure? Not enough. More. There should be more. Yeah, there should be more. We live in a world that's you know divided equally amongst genders, and therefore they should be represented equally. It's, it's not very much more complicated than that. At the same time, I would remind us that women have been making films for 11 decades now. There are countless films by women out there. The question is, why do we not necessarily know about them? You have a great master like Kira Muratova, who died recently. Her obituary was that size in most national newspapers, whereas we know the great male masters that, that we know and appreciate, when they pass on, will have whole you know, ep issues dedicated to them. We have our women filmmakers. Some of them are working bars. Some of them are still in school. Some of them can't get into the schools. That's where we need to start. We need to look at the canon. We need to appreciate it. We need to screen it. We need to buy tickets for films by women. And then we will know that it exists amongst us. It's not some other thing out there that we have to somehow find. It all exists. We just need to really pay attention to it and bring it up. We have a question right here. Uh, Gerard Bush, uh, Dutch television. Uh, even without polar fracking, do you think the world has been of yeah has been turned off the of its axis right now politically? Pushed off its axis. Um, well, certainly, but you know, I, I don't think that the ecological crisis is a political issue. So. Uh, I, it gets me a little annoyed when, even in response to our film, some people say that because our film does make reference to, uh, you know, humans interfering and the, you know, the, the sixth mass extinction that we're in now, uh, defining this as a political issue is very confusing and perplexing to me. It's not about politics. So uh, the politics essentially is a, not of interest to me. I'm just concerned about people being aware of what your consciousness is, where you are, and how it's treated, and the interrelationships of all ecosystems and everything on this, this planet. So this is not a political issue to me. I, I don't understand how it can even be considered such. Uh, politics doesn't seem to save anything. <laughs> politics is a kind of distraction, and now politics is controlled on the planet in a, by a corporate, it's corporate politics, so this for me is the problem. The, the, the sad thing is, though, it's in our hands, and uh, if people did, uh, were aware of this, and I'm as, as guilty as anyone else, what am I doing? I'm making a silly film with wonderful people, but uh, you know, it's in the hands. If, if everyone here, for example, decided to boycott a certain corporation because they don't like their activities, you could take them down. It's, it's in our, it's, we have the possibility to do these things, but 
time is running out very quickly. And my heart is with the young people like the uh, Sunrise Movement and people who have made this their major concern because their love of life and of the details of living on this planet that are incredibly beautiful and, and strange. And if you imagine in the universe, what chances are there of life as we understand it throughout the universe? It's a very rare, brief thing. It's a very beautiful thing to have our consciousness here. So I just, I hope people appreciate it, I guess. Is there any optimism in that, or are you like the Adam Driver character who thinks that it's going to end well and not well? Well, there is for me optimism, because we do have people that are concerned with it and are making it their focus, mostly younger people. But uh, yeah, there's optimism for sure. Um, but it's just that the time frame is speeding up very quickly. All right, I think we have a question over there. Oh, also, I just want to say, in our film, You know, my optimism lies with Hermit Bob, who uh, uh, people say is the negative, uh, saying negative things, but, uh, and also with the teenagers from the detention center, and I didn't want either of those three kids or, or uh, Hermit Bob to be zombified in the end. So to me, my, my hope lies with those people that have already been kind of pushed out or by choice left a kind of social order that is decaying. So, and I love teenagers. I have a lot of hope in teenagers. And teenagers, too, I just got to say, have brought us so many, you know, they define our, they define our clothes, our style, our music, uh, lots of cultural things. And so uh, teenagers bring us our changes in music and uh, so many things. And yet teenagers are treated quite badly, mostly. And told to grow up and, and they have a lot of pro, you know, difficulties going on inside them just physically. So I, I have a lot of, uh, I don't know, I say, come on, I, I'm with the teenagers. I really appreciate them. Right, over there. Hi, um, my name's Jamie Johnson, I'm from The Telegraph in London. Um, it's a question for Selena Gomez. I was interested earlier, you said that social media has been terrible for the younger generation with all the uh, people being exposed and all the rest of it. Um, as someone who's got 150 million followers on Instagram, what more can you do to be able to make these social media sites a better place? And what more should these big tech companies be doing to make it a safer place for people to exist? I think it's pretty impossible to make it safe at this point. There's no blocking anything. They're exposed to it immediately. And again, I've, I'm very grateful I have the platform. So in any way that I can, I'll share things that I'm really passionate about. Uh, I also don't do a lot of uh, pointless pictures. I, I think for me, I like to be intentional with it. It it just scares me, that's all, because I, I see these young girls, and I'll meet them in meet and greets or something, and they're just devastated dealing with bullying and not being able to have their own voice. So, yeah, I mean... It, it can be great in, in moments, but I, you know, I would just be careful and allow yourself some time limits of when you should use it and when you shouldn't. Okay, we, we have time for one more question. It's going to be over there. Hi, I'm Shireen Sharif uh, from BBC Arabic in London. Um, speaking about the, the movie and the ideas behind it, uh, in the movie you made the zombies, or the zombies were really keen about very materialistic things that uh, we've seen in the film. Even over the human connections, even between families, like the grandmother ate her granddaughter in the film. Uh, are you saying, or warn, is it a warning that the modernization and the mater mater materialization is affecting our humanity and it is overwhelming? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, this whole culture of commodity fetishism is very detrimental and kind of strange. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know what more to say really about it. But I, I wanted to say one thing since we're ending here. I wanted to respond to uh, what you asked Selena. I, I just want to say Selena has been incredibly admirable in, in my consciousness 
of uh, encouraging young people to have their own will and be strong people. And she is looked up to by so many young people because of her personality and her will and supportiveness. And it's really remarkable. She's a remarkable person. And, and I just want to say, the, I wrote this film f thinking of Tilda, of Bill Murray, of Chloe, um, Steve Buscem Buscemi, Adam Driver, people I'd worked with before that I really love, and then my chance to work with other people that I had not worked with, like Selena or Danny Glover or Caleb Landry Jones, people whose work I, I love. So I am just so honored to have made this film with, with them, with Josh and Carter, with collaborators like Fred Elms, who I've worked with for many years, many films, and he has taught me so many things about how you make a film. And all these collaborators, you know, uh, Catherine George is remarkable, and our editor too, Afonso Gonsalves, and I just wanna say, Whatever the film is, I don't really know. We, we did our best, but I'm just so honored to have had this chance to work with such remarkable people. I feel like, what a gift, you know? And so if you think the film is negative or my personal philosophy is negative, it's not. I, I'm very overjoyed to even be here with all of you. So anyway, thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Avec plaisir. It's a great film.